Verses 1 and 2. Blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Now notice that he begins here with a negative. I hear and I have heard all my life, oh, negative this, negative that. But it's interesting that he begins with a negative. Blessed is the man that walketh, I think in old days a negative, <laughs> walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Negative commands, thou shalt not, or statements, are very valuable. And this is the case because much that destroys happiness is the very fruit of sinful activity. Keeping in mind that sin is the transgression of God's law. 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. Thus, we ought to appreciate the value of negative commands. They keep us from going astray. Um, they're like barriers. They're like walls. They're like fences. They keep us away from where we can be harmed. And, of course, from the misery that would follow being harmed. So, it's said that the truly happy person walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. The person does not following counsel coming from people who are ungodly. How can I best live my life? Well, don't you want to go to the rankest center to learn that? Well, certainly not, but people do. Many of us do not know where to go for proper counsel. So we don't want to follow the advice of people who don't care for God, who have no interest in serving God, 
who care not a thing in the world about God and His Word. But now notice that's not all that he says. He says, nor standeth in the pathway, if you please, of sinners. Well, the idea is people who are godly, people who want happiness, don't hang around those that don't. Well, who are those that don't? Sinners. People who love sin. People who love violating God's law. People who don't care a thing in the world about what God says about life. So you don't stay. You don't pick. You don't go where they are. You don't say, boy, I want to have a happy life. Let me go down to the beer joint and keep company with all those fine, upstanding sinners. You just don't do that. And this protects us from the temptation to go with them. Because when you're with a group of evil people, you have a lot more encouragement to do right, don't you? <laughs> to do evil, not right. Evil companionship corrupts good morals. So we don't want to be tempted to do evil. Because if we walk with them, if we linger with them, if we choose to be with them, then the temptation's there. Notice also he says, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. A righteous person is not going to join in with those who ridicule, who make light of, and mock those who are trying to love God and keep His commandments. Have you ever noticed that people who are against the truth of God's Word and how to live your life, have you ever noticed how that many times they, they engage in mockery when it comes to people who love the truth and live it. And they do this, have you ever wondered why? It bolsters up their own strength to be wicked. It is a way of defending their ungodly conduct, their actions that are wicked. And you watch every one of them and they will oppose outright if they're wicked enough that which is good. Even curse it. Notice the example of Hebrew poetry. That gets interesting here because it's not really like our poetry. And it's found in this, in this given verse. When you read Hebrew poetry, you're, you're seeing that the, the writer stresses the thought rhyme, the thought rhyme, rather than, as we do, the word rhyme, where the thoughts are somehow related rather than just the words themselves. And such thought rhyme was often expressed in what would be called various forms of parallelism, uh, whether it's synonyms, uh, or you would have uh, what is antithetical, and you can see that in, in verse 6 actually. But nevertheless, understanding literature and the mindset and the inspiration, using that literature of that time and those people, that's what you have. And this verse, therefore, may be taken to describe the journey that a person is taking or what is on. First, you'll notice one is going along with the crowd. Then, taking a stand with the crowd and finally reaching a point where sinning is not enough but actually mocking that which is right or those that are doing right is added shows you the digression even of people who go wrong now looking at it from that way don't do this don't do that don't do the other he then talks about character from a positive perspective. And that's very important. I read to you already verse 2, but I'll read it again. But his delight is in the Lord, the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. What do you delight in? A lot of things, I hope. But I hope all those things are authorized by the will of heaven. 
but do we delight in the law of the Lord? Now, I want you to think about this for a minute. What was the law of the Lord to the psalmist? It's the part we rarely study. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Maybe part of Samuel, 1 Samuel. You like reading Deuteronomy? Like meditating on it day and night? How about Leviticus? Well, that's what he's talking about. The source of his joy and happiness is the will of heaven for him. And he lived in the Jewish dispensation, the Mosaic Age, in which the Jews approached God through basically the Pentateuch. It is truly his delight. Now you have that manifested even more so, and we won't try to read all of them by any stretch of the imagination, but if you want to see them all lined up together, just go read Psalm 119. Now I'll look at verse 16. I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. Verse 24. My testimonies also are my delight and my counselors. Verse 35. Make me to go in the path of thy commandments. For therein do I delight. Notice that word delight shows up in all of these. And then in verse 47. And I will delight myself in thy commandments, which I have loved. And you just go right on through it, and you'll find that kind of idea presented in a number of places in the Bible. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 15 is one of those places that I would like to go to now and uh, read it just for a moment. Just two verses, verses 16 and 17. Thy words were found, and I did eat them, and thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart. For I am called by the name, thy name, O Lord God of hosts. I sat not in the assembly of the mockers, nor rejoice. I sat alone because of thy hand, for thou hast filled me with indignation. Now he says something there, that is the prophet Jeremiah that a lot of people just are not prepared to do. If you will be in love with God, therefore in love with His Word, in the doing of His Word, always seeking first His will, you find yourself alone a lot of times. And a lot of people just aren't willing to be alone when it comes to being the one that's right, and I mean by right, doing what God says. But it seems to be the view of the great prophet Jeremiah and you think of the work he was doing at the time he was doing it and the way people were around him that that was really something because he was alone as he spoke out against the people of his day and he preferred all of this over the counsel of the ungodly that's a choice he makes therefore in his law he meditates day and night I don't know that many people take time to do real meditating as he talks about it. But meditating is a good thing. I watched the news and on Channel 11, CBS outlet here. They, I don't know what got them doing this, but there will be a pause there at the noon news and they have a, a zen moment. Well, it's sort of a peaceful scene. Basically, it's trying to just get everything out of your mind and look at a very placid, peaceful scene. Well, that's not real meditation. But it takes that to get to thinking about the meaning of God's words as they apply to your life. It mean, If you look up the word, it, it literally means to moan, M-O-A-N, to hum, to utter, to speak. Now, we might like this one better to muse. And, and the picture that these words draw is of, one, is of a man reading and rereading and thinking about it and maybe reading out loud to himself. He's pondering what he hears as he reads. He's thinking about what it means to his life. So this he does with God's Word 
day and night. Remember, be still and know that I am God. I think one of the greatest detriments we have in our rat race society where the rats win most of the time is just simply finding a peaceful spot to sit down, read your book, and contemplate it. A lot of times we're studying and we're looking up a Greek or a Hebrew word or just the English word or we're talking about context and remote and immediate context. Now the Bible author, well, that's all good. I believe in it very, very much. But none of that does you any good unless you start to think about, well, how is it affecting how I think and what I do and where I go and how I deal with myself and with others? Yes, sir, buddy. Well, we are right now. That's right. That's, I've got that right down here, too, talking to himself. And it's like Brother Harmon said, said he always like to listen to a wise man and like to speak to a wise man. Did you get that? <laughs> so there, there's some truth to that. What are, you're doing all you can in the reading of the material to plant it in your heart. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. It's that in-depth reading. It's, a, it's not like reading a novel. It's not like reading a Western. It's not like reading some mystery. It is something that becomes your necessary food. You're digesting it. I like that word. I'll use that one. You're digesting it. You're letting the nutrients of it go into your being that you might know how to use the strength in dealing with yourself, your family, everybody else. Now, of course, we're not talking about some sort of entering a monastery or becoming a monk uh, or a monastic existence. Uh, it is simply a, an emphasized, concerted interest that is far beyond any kind of casual acquaintance. I often say to people, it's good to just read your Bible from the standpoint of you up reading it, because that creates a familiarity with the Scriptures. But this goes beyond that. You have that familiarity with the Scriptures, but then you have that in-depth meaning that flows from them and the application of that meaning in your life. And this is the idea in meditating upon his word day and night. And, and a person is doing it uh, habitually. A person is doing it steadfastly. A person is doing it routinely. It's part of their necessary existence. They made it that way by their own choice because it is God's word. It's given to instruct and guide and to keep us in the way of righteousness. So we have to set aside time and when we do that, we want to use it in studying the Word and meditating on it. We can't just haphazardly do these things. Remember the general practice that all people have in doing things by the authority of the Lord is that it's decently in order. Decently and in order. Well, I've studied the Bible ought to be decently and in order. So, look in verse 3 now. And he, what, the person... Of verses 1 and 2. He shall be like. It's going to be like a tree. Not just a tree. But a tree planted by the rivers of water. Let's look at this figure of speech to describe righteous people. A tree we usually think of as something that's going to be there. It's solid. It's right where it ought to be. In fact, I will go over to Psalm 92, I believe. And I want to look at verses 12 through 15. 92, 12 through 15. Notice how he does the same thing again as far as a figure using a tree. The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree, and he shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. 
Those that he planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing. To show that the Lord is upright, he is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in him. And if you go back over, which we won't right now, to Jeremiah, you'll see that same thing, showing that this is a stable, set person who will not be moved. It's like a tree. And of course, I have to say, and Ken's referred to this some on Wednesday night, that in those arid regions and climates, this kind of thing, a tree planted by the water, had special significance. And that's the next point. It's a tree, but it's planted by the rivers of water. In other words, here's a person whose life is rooted in the Word of God. It's not just something he touches on now and then, says the Bible's the Word of God, and I hear it read in sermons, and I hear it read at funerals or whatever. It's something I, it's a necessary food. And thus we receive constant nourishment from it. Now in an arid region, a dry climate, if you've got a tree planted by an actual river and the river runs constantly, you don't have to worry about watering it. It's going to be like it always is. We've all had, had something we've planted and we realize the value of water. And I know sometimes when you have a garden, you put out tomato plants and things like that, then they look pretty as you water them and you make sure they're really watered in well, but then you go back the next day and maybe it's been a hot day and they look sort of limp and pitiful and you pour that water to them again and they perk right up. Well, when you've got a river of water and a tree planted by it, no problem. And that's the way he says that a Christian ought to be. And I say Christian because I bring it over to the Christian age and the Lord's church and members of the church to have this peace of mind and prosperity. He says that brings forth fruit in its season. Well, that's what fruit trees do, and they were very important and still are today, but there must be some fruit production. There must be a, a yielding of something. It provides uh, blessings to others through the fruit that it yields, and that's the way a godly person is, and a person that is truly at peace with himself truly happy, truly blessed. He says, whose leaf shall not wither. Whose leaf shall not wither. Well, that harkens really back to what I've already said, to where the tree is by the river of water. It's not going to be handicapped. It's not going to dry up and blow away. So it's not going to be affected by times of drought. Well, now just make the application to the person who's going to be a happy person. If he's rooted in the truth and he continually gets that nourishment, then let the times of drought come because it's not going to handicap him. So adverse conditions of the world will not affect its fruitfulness. Christians are going to bear fruit all the time. Don't just let bearing fruit be converting people. That's not the way to look at it. Uh, look at pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father's this, to visit the widows and orphans and to keep oneself unspotted from the world, James 1.27. That's fruit-bearing also. Then notice, whatever he does shall prosper. Now, this is not that prosperity sermon that you hear TV preachers <laughs> preach, that if you send millions to me, you'll get hundreds. And you'll be happy, and I'll be happy too. It's not that kind of thing, that if you're faithful, you automatically get rich. I heard a preacher some time ago said, why it's not that money, the love of money is the root of all evil, it's the lack of money is the root of all evil. And he preached that every time he got up. Well, I'm afraid he missed it, but there sure were a lot of people there that were helping him get all sorts of money. Uh, so the figure of the tree, though, is, is now left behind. Whatever he does, he shall prosper. I think you have to recognize that's a general rule. There are always exceptions that can occur. 
but the prosperity ultimately and finally of the child of God and the happy person is that I know always, regardless of my circumstances, that I'm at peace with God. And that God is at peace with me. And you can put up with a lot when you know that you're acceptable to God. And you know how to measure whether you're acceptable to God. It's not in physical feelings. So when you feel bad, God's against you. When you feel good, you're all right. It's because you know the book and you know your life's in harmony with it. A life, we can say it in this way since I said a general, a general rule, a life of piety as a rule, a general rule, is blessed far more than those who live contrary to God's will. Piety will heed God's direction for success in life, remembering why this life is here. If you don't look at this life as a place to get ready for heaven, you'll never have contentment. You'll never be happy. Never. The ultimate in this life is to realize it's a place to get ready for heaven. And that's it. Everything else that goes along with what's necessary while we're in the flesh and how the Bible regulates our appetites and what we do as far as this life is concerned, well, that's important because we're letting God direct us. Well, ultimately, all of that has to do, in my mind, with getting ready to go to heaven. Piety will actually heed God's warnings concerning what a wasteful life is and what a productive life is. So such is the character and such is the prosperity of the righteous person. Righteous people are truly happy and a blessing to others and it's all because they abide in God's word at all times and in all places they also become a monument to God's faithfulness and the value of living by his word but now at this point what is the condition of the unrighteous the condition of the unrighteous that is those who do not delight in God's word those who fail to receive the nourishment from it and I think you'll see the next two verses will deal with that look at verse 4 the ungodly are not so but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away so they're nothing like the righteous we would do well when we see people out here in the world, they don't care about the Bible. If you were to try to study with them, they'd mock you and they wouldn't do it, etc., etc., etc. Give you all sorts of negative responses to anything that has to do with being godly. Just remember this. They're like the chaff. And Jesus said plainly in Matthew 3, 12, they're going to be burned up. You don't want to live that kind of life. The ungodly are not so. Uh, again, in the Hebrew language, emphatically it says, not so are the godly. Ungodly. <laughs> not so are the ungodly. So the contrast is illustrated by the psalmist. He doesn't describe withering trees. But as I said just a moment ago, he talks about the chaff which the wind drives away. And alluding to chaff off of wheat or barley or something like that, wheat uses what we think of, when they beat it and separated the actual wheat seed from the chaff that covers it, and then they throw it up in the air and the lighter chaff gets blown away off the threshing floor, then Jesus took that even further and said, that's what you take and burn, you don't take the wheat. And you see, this is describing a very bleak existence. It's a life of futility, ending in eternal separation from God and the devil's hell. Their life is, has no substantial value. It's going to be blown away, not going to be found. It's going to be burned up, Matthew 3.12. That's the life of those who don't know the Bible, not interested in it, don't care about God, and live for themselves. 
if you dare, you might try it on somebody if you're around them that are like this. And ask them like the father did the son one time when he was in school. What are you going to do when you graduate from high school? He said, well, I'm going to go to college. What are you going to do when you graduate from college? He said, well, I suppose somewhere about that time I'll get married. He said, what are you going to do after you marry? He said, hopefully we'll have children. Well, what are you going to do after that? Well, I'm going to work, make a living, raise those children, do just what my parents did for me and put them through school and uh, hopefully raise them. They'll be grown. They'll have marriages of their own, homes, and have grandchildren. They said, well, what are you going to do after that? So I said, I'll reach a stage where I'll, I'll retire from my regular job. I'm able. I'll get older. He said, well, what are you going to do after that? You see where he's headed, where everybody heads. You die. And finally the son said, well, I guess I'll die. And the father said, no, it won't be any guess about it. You will die. And then the question, well, what are you going to do after that? Now try that wherever you find somebody. And you'll find their minds don't even go up to death. That to the worldly-minded person to say, death is one of the worst curse words he can ever hear. Because everything he's built his life around has been here. It's been the chaff. And he gives no thought to the fact that when you get into eternity where there's no time, there's no material anything, nothing like that. When you get eternity, you're there in one of two places. You're there. There's no hope to get out. There's no warning out if you're in torment. That's just the way it's going to be. And when you'll talk about it like I'm talking about it now, in your mind, you'll say, you'll still want to, if you don't watch out, your mind will say, well, there has to be an end of it. End of, no, there's no end. There's no end. Now, we like it when it comes to the glories and majesties and the peace of heaven. There's no end. But when you, when you think of the torment of the person who dies outside of Christ and lost, the chaff, there's just no end. Your mind may say, well, it goes out so far. And it's, no. Every time you get to there wanting to stop it, no, it keeps going on. It keeps going on. Well, that's what people who build their life around the affairs of this present world seek their happiness in. And when you stop this world, their happiness is gone, such as it is. So there's no value to most people's lives. And that's why we're back to the beginning of this. Depression, boredom, misery. And that's the reason people take their lives, because they cannot see a far off. And by far off, I mean beyond the flesh. So their sorry condition pretends no good end. Look at verse 5. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. It's my understanding and study that this Hebraism, which is simply calling, uh, looking at a Hebrew idiom, Meaning that the wicked shall not be able to maintain himself. By his own strength, by living for this world, as if this is all there is to it, he can't maintain himself. That is, they, are, they must sit or fall down, like better way to put it, in shame when convicted of their guilt, because it's all on their shoulders. They bear every bit of it. Brethren, do you realize as children of the living God that we bear not that guilt? The precious blood of Christ, we contacted the waters of baptism, took it all away, washed it away. And 1 John 1, 7 says that we walk in the light as He is in the light. We have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. That's ongoing. That's perfect tense in the Greek, which means linear action. You don't ever have to bear the guilt of sin. It's taken away. Do you realize the people of this world that don't even believe in God, but see, God set eternity in their hearts so they bear the guilt of sin. It hurts their mind. They may not know all the details because they don't know the Bible what it is to break it. But they know they're not happy. 
It seems that the final judgment is what is involved here. Ultimately, depart from me, ye that work iniquity, into everlasting fires prepared for the devil and his angels. So, he says, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. Well, we have to associate with people who don't love God and keep his commandments here on this earth. But don't you long for the day when the only people you'll be around in total perfection and glory in the very presence of God and all the angels and all of the ancient servants of God from before, that's all that will be there? Everybody that all their lives wanted to serve God. Like Abraham, he looked for a city with that foundation whose builder and maker is God. We will find it someday. But it's because we'll be, like we've described here, of the man that is righteous. The ultimate assembly then is the glorified church in heaven, where the worship of God is complete with perfection. There will be, you talk about friends, you can't have closer friends that will be in heaven. We participate in everything to perfection the way God wants it. And that's the way it will be. We'll be gathered together to receive the eternal reward at the judgment. And we'll be assembled together in heaven where the sinner has no place whatsoever. And that person has no thought about those things in this life. You live for this life, how are you going to think of heaven? You can't. So here's the truly happy man. And it ends with the final contrast between the two ways. In 6a, he talks about the way of righteous, the righteous person. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous. We have a God who will take care of us. We sing that song sometimes, God will take care of you. And we sometimes forget, even though I don't understand how he does it, he will. And I'm glad to let it go with that. That gives me peace of mind to know my concern to do His will. He will take care of everything else. The Lord knows the way of the righteous. Now, let me emphasize that word know. The word knows suggests deep interest in. Um, offering great care to the person that's known. Well, that's God over His people. So we can say God Himself goes with such a person throughout His or her life. But notice the contrast in 6b, the way of the ungodly. What is it? But the way of the ungodly shall perish. Shall perish. Shall end in eternal ruin. So his path becomes less defined until it loses itself. It's like a trail that finally fades out or ends in some sort of swamp or some place like that. So what's our conclusion? Well, is not the end described for the ungodly a true description of those who go through life bored Depressed or otherwise unhappy. Listless lives with no sense of purpose, no direction. Gradually, you might put it this way, unraveling. Now, why is this so? Because they heed the counsel of the ungodly. They do not heed the teaching of God's Word. Do we desire to be the person who's truly happy? The one standing strong like the well-nourished tree always bearing fruit with the Lord always at our side. As Jesus said, I'm with you always even unto the end of the world. So the key then is to, and here it is, to delight and meditate in the word of the Lord and not heed the counsel of sinners, whatever way it comes. So in whose counsel do we delight? 
that counsel of God's word or what comes from ungodly people in this world. If we seek true happiness, let the Lord through his word be your counselor and guide no matter what. Then choose to be with those who do the same. You know, as a young person, desiring to serve God, I learned a long time ago I was going to have to be with those who had the same desires I did. And going to a state school right after high school, entering a freshman at 17, that required some pretty good choices in a state school in their dorms. Anybody that's ever been there knows what I mean. But we managed to get through it, got opportunities to preach, I thought I never would house. Not that I considered it as such in those days, because a lot of times there was a lot of un one-liners. But I found out that I could pretty well put the ungodly to flight. Will you go with me to Bible study? And if, <laughs> if they didn't care about that, then they usually leave me alone. There's ways to do things. There's ways we check ourselves. There's ways you keep yourself on the straight and narrow. It's all dependent upon your love of God, your faith in God. If you're a child of God, we're so thankful you are. You're on the right path. The key is to stay on it. It's one reason Psalm 1 is there. If you're not a child of God, we've studied in this sermon briefly the plan of salvation, of believing in Christ, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in Christ, and obeying Him and being baptized into Christ for the remission of sins, and to live righteously before Him in the church that He will add you to all the days of your life. If you need to repent of sins, confess them, pray God for forgiveness, we give you this opportunity at this time when we stand and sing. <coughs>